before. We had a 200, this is about 50 people today. We had one meal that served 200 people. And uh, we had a full hog, it was called a hanger bash. And, um, and then with that, there was, uh, of course, some uh, liquid libation that went along with that that made the pork taste a little bit better. Bit time. <laughs> so anyway, we, we're, we're blessed to have you guys here today. This is awesome. We want you to get the word out. We've talked to any, we've had people join, that come to the visit the museum, anywhere from a field trip of fourth and fifth graders, all the way up to a couple of different nursing homes. We go to their classrooms. We love turning the museum into their classroom. So it's just, a, it's, it's, we want it to be one more destination in Evansville, Indiana for reason people to come here. But we want the people who live here to be proud of it. So we can, like Mark was saying, an um, awesome opportunity for volunteers to help us. Nothing strenuous, uh, you know, or it can be if you want to turn it into something. But anyway, um, we've got an awesome group of speakers today. We've got a group of speakers that are used here all the time. One of them is Mark Brown. So um, we're blessed to have you guys here, like I said, and uh, we're excited about you, you coming to the program. And don't forget about the uh, time in the Legacy Room on uh, June 30th at the old National Bank building. Like he said, it's the best seat in the house in Evansville, Indiana. He said it was on top of the old National Bank building. Actually, it's one story down where you're in the air conditioning. It's not on the road. So I did, thought I'd clarify that. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, one other thing, there's a couple people back by here. Zane is a volunteer, Don Bone, and there's also uh, uh, Jan Howe. And they're all behind the scene over there, but uh, Donna Bone, myself, and a few other people gave lectures to the high school students, every high school class the last two years, about World War II and everything. And it looks like it's on the docket for next year because freshmen and sophomores in high school need to know these, this information. So you know most of the things we're going to say today, but they need to know it. And we need to get it in the youngsters, understanding what Evansville did, what the tri state did. Uh, during World War II. I will stress a little bit on World War II, and we have three CBs that are going to talk after you. Don't worry, we're not going to go too long, and we'll get you out of here when things are over. You can go to the room that most of you haven't seen. It's individuals that are heroes here from Evansville in that room, straight behind the Cyrus room, and then you can spend your time in the museum as much as you want. You have to leave by 4.01 today, p.m. Okay, so what we're going to talk about uh, I have two other speakers, Brian Brevo, Alex Decker, Mike Rowlett. They're all three CBs, and another guy named Wayne Gurren. Wayne Gurren is 94 years of age, he couldn't make it today, and I'm taking his place. Uh, he had, uh, the next slide, <coughs> Brian, if you push that button, you can't see it very well, but these are called Marks and Maps, and that's what <laughs> Wayne was going to talk about, so I'll say a few words about what he, was, what he did. Marks and Maps, are made of steel and they're 10 feet tall. That's as tall as this screen, 10 feet, and they're 15 inches wide. They're 66 pounds each. And they put these marks and maps down in World War II. It started about 1939 40. That airport runway is 6,000 feet long, and the other one's 8,000 feet long. It's 150 feet wide. The Sea Beach made a runway in the Philippines and many other places in the world in World War II in two days. 5,000 feet by 250 feet. These maps, these maps, distributed the weight so the tires could hit, even in mud and other types of inclement weather. Amazing thing for World War II. That's just one of the things the CBs did. Second thing we have, the uh, Bailey Bridges on one of the windows there, the Bailey Bridges, the CBs would make a bridge after Hitler or the Japanese destroyed bridges in World War II. Next slide. Before we get into what we're going to, there's a Cyrus here reunion. I have many of you on tape in 2014 who said what you did. You can get it on YouTube. We have it on film over here on the other side of this uh, this uh, this little wall over there. It has a movie of, of uh, Bob Gresso, and also and that's about a 47 minute movie about Ellis, about the Bucyrus Street plan in Evansville. But we also have each one of you, not all of you, but we've got a lot of you talking about what your job was at Bucyrus here. That was, I think you were still at the uh, that, what was that place on the west side, Carl Gables or something? Corral. 
or the crowd, or the crowd, or something else. I think it was there. Okay, next slide. This is Bussire's here video. That's of, of uh, talking about talking about Bussire's. It's a very good. I can't go over all the details of Bussire's. Bob has done a great job. He wants to do a second edition to it, but it really goes over a lot of what went on in that factory for many, many years. Next slide. This is what I'm going to talk about. Can you see it from the back row? Okay. We're getting up to Bussire's here. We're going back about 250 years now. Okay, we're going to fast forward quickly. Don't worry, I'm not going to take very long. Okay, but your lives, our lives have all changed because of this, what happened. It's called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution happened between 1760 and 1840 or so. What happened is they figured out how to use steam to make machines. It changed everything. Right here, if I say how many people are farmers here, probably less than 10 to 20 percent are farmers. But if I did the same talk 100 years ago or 150 years ago, it would be 9 percent farmers and 10 percent somebody else. So what most people did in early times in the United States was farming. The steam engine was created in 1773, about the same as our country was created in 1776. It didn't get much along for a while. But it changed everything, and the first people to use it were farmers. I mean, other people used it, millers used it. The only thing where you could get power prior to that time was the wind, which is not very predictable, and the water. And the water, all the mills use it, but the wind and water are not predictable things. So all of a sudden, this allowed man to control some of the things with energy. So the steam engine may help make you Cyrus here. It gave all of you a lifetime of work, or your spouse is a lifetime of work. So what happened after they could make steam and they could make big equipment, tools and everything became important. So agriculture and textiles were important. One of the first machines we used for all those things the South. You think of how much that cotton in the South. The next thing that was steamships, Clayton, Ohio, the steamships and the railroads. The Golden State was put in the middle of our country in 1859. Railroads were important. If you saw here, all these equipments and requires to help make railroad, make the you know the railways. They help do that. They help do things. So it changes our cultures, changes our society. We were all of a sudden farmers, all of a sudden we became you know, social beings, because we had to live in these big cities, because we worked at these big companies like Osiris. Next slide, please. So, we, we're talking a little bit about war. So the Caribbean War was the first one that used these machines. It used these things called uh, explosive naval shells. This was 1854, 1856. And then they used railroads and telegraph. We got internet today, they used a the telegraph, and it was a tremendous invention. Next slide. This is our Civil War, the seven big things that happened in the Civil War. Rifles, these bullets, they made them in Shelley's balls, and then repeat shots, 30 seconds from life, 30, uh, uh, seven shots in 30 seconds, that's a pretty big deal instead of one shot. Balloons, submarines, but railroads, big, the, the North had 22,000 miles of railroads, the South had 9,000 miles of railroads, the railroads in some of your machines made by companies like the you weren't there yet, but you were around, around the corner. But telegraphs, Andrew Carnegie, the father, I think of steel, he was real young then, and he put, helped put 4,000 miles of telegraphs. So where did he have to go every day? He went to the telegraph office, and he found out what his army was doing. Lincoln used the telegraph every day. So that was modern war for that happened. Next slide. Then, the second industrial revolution. This is where you were born. Right here, it says 100 years ago, this is when B. Cyrus was born. You and many, many other companies. So you're born about 1880 or so. So this is the second industrial revolution. You start being on every one of these things I've got listed. Everything B. Cyrus did. And companies like you did. You could make heavy machinery to make things happen. Screwing, or a, a, a lathe, boring machine, milling machine. We've got those machines right over here in this museum from Whirlpool. And it, they was, they created, some of these things were created in the 1870s. And all of a sudden they became big and important and they got fine-tuned and we did better and better work with them. What you are is artisans. Artisans to make good heavy machinery. So these Navy guys could help win wars, but also so we have infrastructure. So it made a big impact in machines and tools. And you are the father of a lot of machinery in our days, today's age. Next slide. So 
World War I. A little bit of chaos in World War I, even though the Industrial Revolution happened a century before. A lot of things were invented then. Movable machine guns, chlorine gas, they quit using that gas. Hitler was using it, or Hitler tried to use it in World War II, but it, it killed the enemy, but it also killed you because the gas blew back to you. They quit using a lot. Plane floors, planes, torpedoes. Improvements in every type of machine they had. But machines is what started winning war. They saw it in World War I. Machines, if you listen to historians, they say machines and infrastructure from the United States won World War II. And you made some of them. Next slide. Okay, so the New Deal. We think everything happened in World War, or World War II. It did. The 1930s, we had a terrible recession here. We had no money, no jobs. So the WPA helped create infrastructure for a decade here. And that allowed us to move machines, material, and everything else around the country quickly. So it made World War II. We were very effective. If I look and see, it tells you hydroelectric, go down to the TVA, go to Kentucky, go to Tennessee. That was created in the 30s. Road projects, railroad improvements. You've got great modernization, telephone, water supply, oil pipeline. Oil pipeline. You helped create things that made our infrastructure nice. That's Osiris here. And companies like you. So the government spent a lot of money. It was deficit spending. We went broke those years. It all was set in 1941. But we had what you call untapped natural resources. Hitler didn't have that. The Japanese didn't have it. That was one of their defaults. Next slide. We had the largest supplier of all these things. Oil, timber, steel, copper, aluminum, plastic. These are things you make war machines with. You use every one of these things in your plant. These things we had plenty of supply. Other countries didn't have that. We had a major advantage, but we had to dig some of those things out of the ground. And how do you make plants work? Well, you gotta have coal, you gotta have electricity. And you guys help make machines that help dig the coal and help run these machines. Not just in, not just in our city, but cities across the country. Next slide. Okay, so World War II. Modern was capable. At the end, we were the dynamite country for 15 years or so. Then we sort of slacked off a little bit. For 15 years, we were dominant because we had all the natural resources, but we had energy. And we had energy because people like you helped make these shovels to get coal so we could get energy to keep our plants going. We were the most advanced for 15 years. And we still remain a leader in the world in industry. Next slide. This, that's a good boy helmet. You can't see it very well, but it talks about how important energy was and you guys helped us get energy. So just think and be proud of your heritage and be Cyrus here. Next slide. Friction machines, hydraulics, stem cylinders. You guys did all kinds of things. Here from 1914 or so, 1983, uh, that Emsco Continental bought you about then. It's here another year. You have this scoop. We have pictures of your scoops over there. Many other things that never built. Next slide. So now, we're going to move to somebody that's going to talk to you about they used a lot of your tools. And this is Brian Brettel. He's been a friend of mine since age five. And it's Browning and then Brettel. There's Brettel and then Browning. So he sat next to me for 13 years of school. So I know him a little bit. He was in the CBs for many years. He's going to give you a little history of CBs and tell you how important CBs are for construction. Mr. Guy thought about CBs, and that's why we're having this talk about CBs. And we've got two other speakers that will talk about their experiences in war are in peacetime and using big equipment. So Brian Reddell. Thank you all for allowing me to come out here today. I really appreciate it. I see a lot of veterans here. Uh, thank you all for your service. We appreciate that. How much louder? Yeah. Like that? Okay, I gotta scream. I'm not used to talking that loud. Uh, for those of you that were not veterans, thank you. We appreciate everything that you did, too. It was very important what the Sire Series did for the veterans and for the military. I have run some of your equipment. It was good equipment. I appreciate the use of it. Uh, if you go to Fort Wayne, California right now, in front of the maybe uh, CD Museum out there, you will see a war grader out there. They have uh, rehabilitated. It's on permanent display there. That just goes to show how much the CVs think of these are equipment. The CVs were formed in 1942 after the Japanese invaded the U.S. 
They had been thought about by Admiral Ben Morrell as far back as 1937 when he took over the yards and docks for the Navy. But when war came, they had to scrap all the plans that had been laid out because they were not practical. <coughs> so they came up. On December 8th, President Roosevelt went to Congress and asked for a declaration of war and was given that declaration of war. 89 days later, on March 5th, 1942, the Seabees were born. While they were on active duty, there were over 151 battalions alone. There were, in the war, 325,000 Seabees. The largest complement at any one time was about 250,000. They were divided into different units, naval construction forces, regiments, battalions, and smaller units, construction battalion units, construction battalion maintenance units, pontoon units. The pontoons are one of the things that the CDs are very well known for throughout the war, both in Europe and in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Those pontoons were even used with large outboard motors to help ferry equipment and men from the ships into the shore because the, uh, the ship could not always make it into the shoreline. So the Seabees came up with their floating pontoons and they put boats uh, in the water, put motors on the back of those pontoons and they ferried people around. They even used some of those pontoons to help ferry George Patton across the Rhine River when he was entering Germany. They had high currents and heavy winds and they were not sure about getting them across. They had to get a lot of people across quickly, so the CVs were there. The CVs participated in every major landing during the Second World War, both European and Pacific. They were very innovative in what they did. So innovative that in 1943, a film was made featuring John Wayne and Susan Hayward. It's called The Fighting CVs. Most of that film was made in Fort Wayne, California. I think we'll get a slide there of that. Right there. Uh, don't know how well you can see it, but that was the, the theater marquee sign that they put up for that. It's an interesting movie. If you've never seen it, uh, most of the time you've seen it in black and white. They just had it on about three weeks ago on the, on the TV. Anyway, construction is not always a safe activity. There are some that think it's uh, pretty safe. But during the Second World War, there were 33 Silver Stars earned by the Seabees due to their action mostly in support of the Marines. But if any of the military services needed the Seabees, the Seabees were there. General Douglas MacArthur, when he came back to the Philippines, was talking about all the people that were under him over there. And he said he's got one great big problem with the Seabees. There's not enough of them. The Seabees were very innovative. They worked from Alaska at ADAC to help build that base up to repel the Japanese out of Kista and Attu, all the way down to the Myrtle Sound in the Antarctic. They have been on six continents fighting alongside the Marines that they support. And over the years, they have made great accomplishments in their engineering and their capabilities of building. Uh, another gentleman's going to be up here talking about Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and I'm familiar with that. I was stationed there for a while. It's an interesting place. We'll leave it at that. He can supply the war efforts. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a really good public speaker. I really apologize for that, folks. Anyway, the CBs are not conventional, as these two gentlemen over here I know can tell you that. Uh, they never have been conventional. They don't always follow the rules real well. That's why some of the Navy brass doesn't always like them a whole lot. And that's also one of the reasons that CEC officers were finally put in charge of CB operations, because the line officers did not understand construction. They did not understand the way the CBs worked. The first CBs were gone out and recruited from construction companies. They were not recruits as we know them today that are so young that have no experience. These people went into the Navy with over 60 different professions behind them. And they used every one of those professions to make everything you would not believe. Culverts out of 55 gallon drums, washing machines out of 55 gallon drums. When the Marines went in and landed on a beach, the Seabees were either with them or right behind them. They built all kinds of roads, wharfs, docks, 
theaters, schools, warehouses, airports. They're very, very famous for the airports that they built. In Henderson Field, that is probably one of the biggest ones they were remembered for during the Second World War. The Japanese had been building that field. It was destroyed by the U.S. The CBs went in. In 11 days, they had their first plane land on that airbase. It was an extremely important airbase in the Pacific Islands. Up to now, we've been talking about that. After the Second World War, they were still very popular. Although their numbers were depleted very quickly, from 250,000 to 20,000. MCB-114 went into Kamchatka, which is in the USSR. They were the only American battalion that ever went into the United Soviet Socialist Republic. They built a weather station on Kamchatka. We had six battalions that actually went into mainland Japan, uh, China, excuse me, and uh, worked at various projects throughout Shanghai and other areas there. Very, very rare that kind of stuff is ever going to happen. And I guarantee you it won't happen again for a long time. But this is how popular the CDs were, not just with our own forces, but with the foreign forces too. They played a vital role in support of all of our military. It's one of those things the CDs really are not known that much about. They're kind of a, we're kind of an odd group out there, but we're proud of it. Very, very proud of it. Anybody that's ever been a CD, as happy he was for the most part, and wouldn't trade for a thing. Did you guys? Anyway, the CBs have served in every war since then. Due to their pontoons again, the raid of Incheon in Korea happened, and it happened very well. It was a very, very renowned strike. They did not expect that coming, and it set the enemy back quite a bit. They served in Bosnia and Herzegovina. They're right now over in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have bases in Manama, Bahrain, Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, Hawaii, still in Alaska, Kodiak Island, all over the U.S. in construction battalion units, and all kinds of foreign soils. Our problem now is they have taken so many of us away. Right now on active duty, we have 7,000 CVs. Reserves, about 6,780. So less than 14,000 CVs out there right now actively participating in the military uh, work. But they're still there every day and every night. And they work, and they work hard. So if you see somebody that is a CV out there, and you know they're on active duty, tell them thanks, because they're supporting you after you supported them. Your equipment was great, your dedication and patriotism to the military was great, and we greatly appreciate everything you've done. Thank you all. Now we, we've got, thank you Steve, or uh, Brian, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Eagle Scout also works at Potoka for a lot of times, teaches industry how to do, uh, do a lot of different teamwork things. So he uh, does all kinds of things. He's a locksmith. And if you go look at the new deaconess, he used to walk up on top of the steel six floors up, you know. Uh, so he's not scared of heights either. So I guess he could be in the Air Force and not just the Navy. Uh, our second speaker, there are people that use some of your machines, and we have some pictures, but because of lighting, not a lot of pictures showing up. So I may hold a picture up and, and show it to you, but we have two CVs. One uh, is uh, Alan Steckler that we'll have talk first, and he has been in uh, Cuba and also Diego Garcia. When I was in the Navy, if I did something wrong, I had to get go to either ADAC Alaska or um, are Diego Garcia. They are isolated places, but he was at one of those places. And remember, those places have nothing, so they need to bring construction things there to make things happen. So he'll talk a little bit about his experiences. He still, there's a hill down in Cuba named Al Al's Hill, named after him. They built something down there, and Mr. Bradford saw that down there when he was there. 
was built, I guess, late 60s, early 70s. Will you talk about some of your equipment and how well it worked for him? This is Alan Steckler, a CB uh, from up there uh, north of Evansville in Dubois County, uh, Fulda area. Ferdinand area, but Fulda is up there, but he's from Ferdinand. And his uh, wife's here today to make sure he says everything right. Now, I'm not a gifted speaker, so bear with me. Thank you for having us. Uh, I was in uh, 69 to 71. Closer, closer. He spoke earlier of uh, experienced people going in early on in the CV. Closer. That was, uh, right into that mic, right I'm into it. That's it. All right. I've eaten the That's it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we went in as uh, an E4, as uh, supposed to be experienced equipment officer. He actually just knew how to load manure and grade uh, roads, but he uh, got us in, and it was very experienced. We went to Oakport, Mississippi for boot camp, and then uh, from there we went to. Uh, oh, you want to talk about it? From there we went to uh, Davisville, Rhode Island. We were uh, supposed to go to Vietnam, but that's when it was tailing all the times. So we ended up uh, went to Cuba, and it, it, it is an isolated place. Wasn't that a whole lot going on? We had a good experience because uh, yeah, I run a TD25 builder down there myself. We uh, worked on a radar installation, and uh, it was uh, I not really had a whole lot of experience with that. And uh, it was good people that we were able to work with, and uh, we were in the tide, so we had um, builders and equipment operator mechanics and uh, we've done, I think, the actual build the, uh, I guess what do you want to call them, the EM club and stuff, that's what the carpenters did. We built some roads and then, like I said, what I was on, we've done a lot of, that was a, just an old uh, radar installation they needed to put uh, a road into. I don't know, I don't think he's got any pictures or he said he couldn't see them, so would have liked to show me some of those. But uh, we were down there for nine months, and uh, I guess uh, after we come back from there, as far as equipment, I mean, you want to talk about the stuff that you guys, we never really had any bizarre area equipment down there, but it makes no difference. But uh, came back from there and was home for it for a while, and then uh, Diego Garcia, people probably don't know much about that island. It was uh, owned by the British, I think the government got a hold of it for we, it's funny how things work with the government and things. That was almost 50 years ago when they built that, and that is a very strategic base right now for like the middle, all the stuff that's gone into the Middle East. All that was was a horseshoe, coral island, and uh, the, the bees went in there and carved the uh, runway and stuff in it so it could get going. There was no water facilities or anything. That's all been developed into. Uh, you know, desalt plants and, and whatever. I think they've got dry dock. It, that, that was an interesting thing too. When we got ready to go to Diego, they, I was, I had probably six months left. And uh, one morning at Moscow, they said they needed ship riders. So uh, they were taking an LSD from California over there with a bunch of supplies. So lucky enough, me and a couple of other guys volunteered and got to go. I'd never been at sea, and uh, we spent, I guess, three weeks heading over there with Hawaii and Australia, and uh, ended up, got to Diego, and got off the ship, and they said, uh, well, I said, you won't be doing much here. He said, we got an early out. So I was there two weeks, so I, I won't be able to tell you much of what actually happened. I have a bunch of really good friends that were there for the whole deployment. And that was quite an experience, you know, when you start out with an island with nothing there and building roads and, and whatnot. But uh, I don't see any uh, pictures of that. Yeah, we can show them there. Brian, 
Brian, go ahead and show him some of those pictures. They're there. Keep rotating through. That's him. That's, uh... Well, that's in the <laughs> Next, next one. Uh, we had, uh, that... I had a really good time down there. They gave me a 25 and uh, run that almost the whole time. We had a rip that the radar installation there, we couldn't blast that thing. So we had to do the glacier rock, and we, I mean, we burned up a minute or two on that thing until uh, we finally got it worked down. But uh, it's uh, very experienced. But anyhow, um, I don't know what this is. I was just an old country boy. I mean, if you guys that's been in the military, you know what it's like. And it, it, just to be able to go out and see the rest of the world, and, and my wife and I, we love to travel and stuff, and that's all on account of the experience to be able to uh, spend the time. But uh, I don't, don't really have a whole lot of other stuff to, to really talk about, so. On the equipment you had, was that reliable that these people made? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not like anything else. You use it, you're going to have a little trouble once in a while, but it, it was all been done the job. A lot of their money was made on maintenance, too. They would fly parts or would get parts out to the uh, construction site, and so a lot of people ordered parts, and if things broke, we got them pretty quickly. Yeah, but that was the thing around in Cuba and stuff like that, when you were that far away, you didn't have the stuff with you. That's what the machine shop or whatever, you know, they work to, to rebuild it. That got to be part of the problem in a place like that. It's just to get the supplies and stuff. All right, thank you very much, Alan. <laughs> I've got my next speaker here, and then we're going to let you mosey along, get more dessert, more salad, and we've got more iced tea and more lemonade. Uh, and. Before you leave, we do have tickets for the old national event at the front desk. If you're interested, that's going to be on, as Mr. Dyke said, June 30th, 2018. That's a Saturday. Uh, part of the tickets in the morning, part of the afternoon, or you can get double tickets. Love to have any of you, all of you there. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to have Mike, his, uh, Mike Brodecker, his, if you've got any back problems or leg problems, he has a brother that works at Sterling Square, that's where Sterling Brewery used to be. He doesn't sell beer, but he's a chiropractor and he'll straighten your back out. So if your back needs straightening your shoulders, oh gee, said, okay, well, he's a guy that's his kids are in the golf, the modern day they are golf, uh, golf grades there. Uh, so if you rebound the paper, but that's his cousin, not his brother. But anyway, Mike talked a few things about, he brought a couple pictures in for us from, there's one, if you had a chance to look at it, so World War One, it looks like it's a beachhead. Has LST in the background. It has one of your bulldozers there in the foreground uh, from over in uh, the Pacific Islands. It looks like it looks like it's an invasion of the shore. But Mike, come up and say a few words, please. Mike Rodecker, he's from uh, New Boy County, too. Okay, Rodecker, sorry, Rodecker. Oh, okay. Catholic from around here, and Father Earl over there. Did anybody know Father Earl? I did his first mass when I served church one time in my life, and uh, that was for his first mass at the same time. It's the only time I ever served. That's good. Um, I can't top that one story about getting to take a cruise after uh, the end of his time. I went to Newfoundland, I went in 1970, and uh, went to Newfoundland for a year and a half, and then, like he said, uh, doc out here said uh, they send you eight act glass it was kind of the same thing up there was nothing doing up there except the uh, noose you know and uh, I did a year and a half up there and he said somebody out and have a hill name I had a dump name after me out there <laughs> I held garbage for uh, six months or so when I first got there and they put it there's an old building out front they put road park so that was my dump that I had <laughs> The reason I went to CB, my dad was a medic in an Army Engineer Battalion down in Kilty. And he said, and I was like, a little bit So he said, when you go in, you only go into CB. He said, they got, they got it made, you know, which they, they knew how to find stuff that they wanted and this and that. So it's, it's pretty interesting for me for those two years. And then Doc's showing some pictures there. 
And mainly what I do now, I'm heavy equipment operator for 30, 45 years now. Uh, I flex a uh, mold machinery and I've got a few sour syrup machines and some bulldozers with the sour syrup blades and stuff. And uh, some of those pictures that he was throwing in rough little, that one, that's a 10 D the sour syrup crane. That was made in Erie, Pennsylvania. Yes. And uh, that that was mine. I sold that to 15 D and that one was actually made in that that's plain over there. And there's a you guys, I don't know if you know much about this, but on the back of these international bulldozers is a cable control unit. It's a double drum cable control, but controlled by pan back here. And I've got a picture, we got some pictures of a bit sitting on the ground, uh, but they mount on the back of the machine, and then you pull the scraper with it, it makes it operate. And well, here's, here's a picture of it sitting on the ground here, it's kind of hard to see. But that was made in Evansville too. And the next picture shows it. That no one plays your plate on it. That's, that's a tent right there. See, that was made at that deal. So that, that's the one that uh, we took a picture of a few weeks ago. But I've got several of those, and I've got a Of course, those pictures I gave you, did, you, did somebody give you them? There's a, uh, some pictures I was passing around here. You guys, you guys might want to look at these because there's a Here's the 22B here, but this is a machine I own, and it's a World War II army truck, a CCKW like that, with a, a military backhoe. And there, if you look at one, there's a real old man sitting on the seat of one. I had that at the uh, several years back at the Evansville uh, tractor show, and we were digging out front there. I don't know if you guys ever go to that thing. And then the old man on there is Basil Graham. He's from Boonville. He's 90. He'll be 97 or 98 this year. He's a World War II CCKW. He would probably, you would probably like him, but he don't get around too good anymore, but I go see him once in a while. And he, he's a real good buddy of mine, and, uh, and he, his mind is right here, so he tells some pretty good stories and stuff. Yeah. Alan and I have gone down there a few times to listen to it, so. and he picked him up and going on a tour once in a while, looking for stuff. He's an old heavy equipment operator, he's a lot too. But uh, if you guys pass them pictures around, and uh, you might, anybody ever want to see something like that, I got a little museum of my own up there. <laughs> Ferdinand. <laughs> yeah. Hey, anytime you can come up there. I talk better when I'm talking just a couple of guys, not a Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, now before we uh, close here, we got one more bird house to give away. Uh, we will give the bird house to uh, whatever, Bob, whatever Bob says. This is Bob Gressel. He's worked at Desiris for a few years, and he's got a few words to say, and then we're going to close up. But I want to thank the, at the Wartime Museum. I want to thank all you Desiris employees and your spouses and families for all you've done forever. So up to a thousand employees, lots of good paychecks, lots of art, art work, art, artistic work in the mechanical machines that uh, has, a, has a lot to uh, a lot to hold uh, because of your talent. So. Uh, my grandmother worked there in 1917 to 1919. She was a secretary there, but uh, she would always type things in 10 carbons because I think that's how they made her do it. You could even put that printer down to 10 carbons. You try to do 10 carbons, it's not easy. She must have strong people. This is Mr. Bob Gressel, uh, wood carver and uh, vet of, uh, of Korea, you know, and also a vet of uh, New South. I think we had two good speakers, and they were there. Uh, a couple things. This book here, I picked up. It's the history of CVs, and it's really good information. In it. Uh, a couple things. The Navy recruited construction, civilian construction, uh, and they wanted the cream of the trades. The average age was 33 years old, so they were just a little older, but they were uh, uh, noted in their trades and so on. That's why the uh, service wanted them. And another thing, they was responsible for 110 major airstrips. And if you see pictures of those countries, there's a lot of scraper blades, a lot of small shovels, 
and our spudder drills and so on. So uh, when they talk the scraper, you'll see the pictures. Uh, there's a couple of them on railroad cars that uh, we were responsible for. During the Second World War, our 100th anniversary book states that we made 3,000 units for the service. So they can be anything from blades to scrapers to sputter drills to small shovels. So uh, uh, we would like to encourage the museum here to put us on permanent display on a lot of this stuff because we were responsible for 3,000 units. And uh, like, like anything else, uh, we want to be remembered by it. Okay, I want to thank Mark and Jennifer for their trouble and keeping this thing alive. Uh, as I stated in a note to use last to the beginning of the year, I'm giving it up, but Mark picked it up this time and wanted to have another session. So unless someone comes forward, it'll die on the vine. So I need someone to say they'll take care of the November one and follow through with it. So come and see me afterwards and uh, I'll give you the information and so on. Uh, I want to thank Jeff Dyke also. Thanks for your time. Um, got any questions, any comments from people?